making the Olympic team was the day that I made it was the most exciting day of my life. That was 10 years in planning and work. And to get there, to achieve that kind of a goal, a 10 year goal, um, how, how do you put that into words? Uh, an, an athletic achievement at that point. Um, and I've had some good achievements in fencing along the way, but that was the main goal, was to make the Olympic team. I was 30 years old when I made the Olympic team. Um, I actually was very close in making it uh, when I was 26 and when I was uh, 22, I had just made the squad. So there was little chance of doing it then. I was actually very close to making the team. I made the finals of the nationals that year and it was a race between me and four other people to make the team. The two front runners were myself and Jack Tehatchik. Jack was a tremendous competitor. Um, we happened to meet in the round of 12, and I happened to break through. I beat him by one touch. And I thought for sure at that point I made the team. But when I got to the finals, I realized there was still a race on between me and Mark Smith. Whoever finished higher was going to make the team. I had the unfortunate draw of Mike McKay in his hometown to make the team. We both lost to uh, Mike McKay that finals, but I drew him first. So I was out in the round of uh, eight and I believe Mark lost to him in the gold medal bout. To make a team, it takes a lot of perseverance. You work hard and hopefully you can make it. I had to make some assessments though. One, I am not tall. Okay, most of the guys, I would say um, maybe the only other guy my height, and he's still taller than me, was uh, Pat Gerard in top 10 fencers. You can go even top 20 fencers. There were maybe two guys that were my height. I, I was definitely one of the more height disadvantaged in the game. There's no making me taller, right? <laughs> a full adult, there's no way to make me taller. So what were my options? Um, one, I could be stronger than most everybody out there if I work at it. The other, uh, be faster. And I was already pretty fast. So building a little more speed and making myself a little stronger than the others, that gave me an advantage. As far as knowledge of the game, at that point, at the age of 22, I already had 17 years of fencing. And as far as really training hard, I started doing that at 14. So I had a huge advantage over most of the people. Most at that time started in college. There were a handful of us, like Greg Masialis, uh, Michael Marks, um, maybe Jeff Bucantz. We, there like maybe a few others, we, they started like me as a, a kid. I started at five, five years old. Um, those guys, they may have started like maybe 10, 10 to 14 years old. It is very young to start at five. Um, my parents, they were looking for a sport for my oldest brother. He had asthma. So they went to the doctor with many different sports and asked, what did they think of this one, that one? They came with uh, the idea of playing golf. And the doctor was like, no, you can't play golf. He has asthma. You're going to be outdoors, the trees, everything. You know, that's going to work. So they went through many different sports. They came across fencing as a possible sport. They went to the doctor. The doctor's like, indoors, anaerobic. This is perfect. The perfect sport for uh, somebody who has asthma. So he got started, I think, at the age of 10. And um, my parents, they just decided to put us all in the sport as we grew. Uh, at the time, I wasn't even born yet when my brother started. So fast forward um, five years from that point, six years, uh, I was about uh, five years old. And that's uh, it's like, well, it's time to get him started in a sport. My parents took me to the fencing club and said, let's go. He's got to learn. First coach was John McDougal. He was a fantastic uh, fencing instructor, um, graduate from Stanford. He actually started American Fencer Supply, the main fencing supply company for the West Coast. 
But at the time he started that, he also started a fencing school. It was called the San Francisco uh, Academy of Fencing, I believe. Not sure. And then um, because of financial problems, he had to close the fencing school. So he sent all of the students to Halberstadt. And then I went to Hans Halberstadt after that. And I don't really remember the lessons with Hans. I do remember him standing there with a cigar in his face, his mask while he was giving me a lesson. Now I remember, I'm about six or seven years old. So I'm way down low. <laughs> and there's no way I'm gonna hit him in the mask. And he has a cigar and a hole in his mask to put the cigar while he's giving me a lesson. <laughs> I didn't really start competing until I was about eight. There's hardly any kids. I didn't really fence in a um, an age category fencing tournament until I was uh, 10. And this is strictly for San Francisco. So the age category is under 16. And it was a um, um, high school tournament open to everybody. And uh, so I'm 10 years old and fencing in this tournament and, and I happened to win it wasn't really great to win my dad was mad at me for winning because <laughs> the kid I beat he thought the other kid was a much better fencer than I was I shouldn't have won because I wasn't good enough to win <laughs> I, I know it sets up a whole lot of psychological stuff for the future however 14 I won the uh, first JOs under 16. And it just goes on. Yeah, everything happens after that. So after uh, Hans Halberstadt died, my, my next instructor, he came in to replace Hans, was Charles Selberg. Selberg got a job at UC Santa Cruz sometime in like 1970. So when he left, um, someone found, uh, I don't know, it was Jack Baker, a local fencing legend, found Mike DeSaro on the streets of San Francisco. Yeah, Mike DeSaro at that point had turned into a hippie and was living on the streets of San Francisco and he was selling newspapers in, uh, on, in the Haight District near Haight Nashbury. Jack said, look, they need a fencing coach, a new instructor at Halberstadt, are you interested? DeSaro goes in, he likes the place, He's interested, although it's a new ground for him because he's never coached anybody before. And, but he's very excited about the idea. As a group family plan, all my brothers and sisters were there taking lessons from Mike DeSaro when he first got started. There's a little history involved there, but he was denied a uh, place on a um, Pan Am team because he wouldn't cut his hair. That was the start of his uh, coaching career. Starting so young, a lot of my actions were innate, almost innate, because uh, uh, I would just know I have to hit, um, and I'd make the point. I mean, that, that was, uh, I can't make it more simple than that. Uh, as much as I learned from all the instructors along the way, all my coaches along the way, what it came down to was I could hit, because I knew that's what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> I think. Um, that by not having that strong competitive urge, a type A type of competitive person, it helped me a great deal. Uh, my brothers, they tended to be much more competitive, much more, um, their, their, their urge to want to win, the desire to win was much stronger than mine. Um, but mine as always just to hit somebody and, and just working on being calm. And that's all I would do is really is just work on being very calm, watching everything that I'm supposed to watch, visually analyzing my opponents and uh, hitting them when I had the chance. I really didn't want to fence it for college because of what happened to my brother, Roy. Um, is when he left the fencing team, all his uh, financial aid was taken away. You know, you have to expect that. And um, as like, I don't want that to happen to me. The idea, it crossed my mind and it was like, yeah, I don't think I want to fence for college. So I went on my academics instead, had my academic scholarships. Um, and I just fenced on my own individually.
to make teams. The United States Olympic Committee created the Olympic Sports Festival. I did well enough in the juniors and I got invited to the Olympic Sports Festival. The first one was in Colorado Springs. I had gone to several after that, but this was the first one. So here we are, and here's the top guns in the United States, top 24, plus a few other people, uh, the junior squad. And um, I had a good day. What could I say? Just had a good day. I make the finals, the top six. But here I am, 20 years old, a new guy in these things, in a competition with these top fencers. And I make the finals. And I'm like, wow, this is great. Well, you know, this is a major step, a major dream for and not even a step, just a major dream for me. So I go home, my parents are happy. They're like, you know, here I'm in newspapers, everything's really cool. Uh, a couple months later, I'm talking with my parents. And I'm saying, you know, should I quit now? Should I stop fencing? Because, you know, I've just proved that I could be there. I can hang with the best of them. Um, and my mom says, well, what else are you doing? <laughs> so, so I was like, well, I thought about it. I thought, well, not really, not much else. So she said, well, then keep fencing. And I had great parental support, always. Not financial support, but always the um, support of them being there for me when I needed it. So when she said that, I was like, man, it's true. I'm not doing anything else. Why not fence? I mean, I was in college. I was doing my college stuff, and they're, they're separate worlds. But uh, I was doing well enough in college. I figure, yeah, I could do this in fence. I could fence, stay in school. Why not? <laughs> So, so I just kept on competing. But from that point on, I was planning out very carefully. Um, years before, when I was 14, as I said, I started working out harder. I was trying to develop my game, trying to be a better fencer. Um, by that point, by 1978, when I was 20, I was like, well, if I'm going to do this, I better do it right. So that's when I really started training harder and studying harder um, about fencing itself. Um, I started a particular weight routine for myself, running programs for myself. Since I was studying um, physical education and biology at that time, I was like, I could do applied sciences here. <laughs> I could do my own experiments on myself to see how I could develop best. Uh, I, you know, one of my professors, uh, Dr. Uh, McGlynn at USF, he would say, you know, there's cross-training effects and you could do one sport to help another sport. Um, or you could do these kind of workouts. This is cross-training, see, uh, see how it works. And this is in 1978, before anybody was really applying that kind of stuff heavily. Uh, so over the course of time, um, I got faster and I got stronger. Uh, when I started, I weighed 156 pounds. By the time, four years later, I was 200 pounds, but very solid 200 pounds. I was trying to see how powerful I could get. So just as a measure, uh, I was bench pressing 350 pounds. You, know, you have to put on some mass to be able to lift the heavier weights. After... Um, 1984, though, I changed my workouts because I thought, yeah, bulking up that big, it's not the best way to go about it. <laughs> but yeah, but the idea was if I wasn't as big as they were, I'd have to be faster and stronger. So it worked. I don't know if you can improve your reaction time. Mine was already really fast. The problem with that, though, most people who have fast reaction times don't know how to use it. So if you know how to use reaction time properly, then you can wait until somebody's an inch away from your chest and then parry them. Or maybe move your body out of the way. Either way, it works really great. And they're always going, I've had so many competitors say to me, 
I know I hit you. I say, I, I think you did test. And they would test. I know they didn't hit me, but they could swear they did because they saw the opening. They know they were right there. And they thought they hit because they were still an inch away and I buried it. If I moved out of the way, it would drive them crazy. It was with Peter Lewison. We were fencing and I made sure he could see my flank. It was wide open. He kept on lunging for it. So I kept on stepping to the side and hitting him, bending my arm. So he couldn't get anything there. So after about the fourth one, suddenly Jeff Bucantz, Eric Rosenberg, and Jack Datchick show up. Or no, maybe it was uh, Mike McKay. They show up and start yelling at him to stop trying to hit me in the flank. But he continued to drive because he saw it. It was wide open. There it was. And every time he went, it just disappeared and I hit him. <laughs> it was a matter of timing though. If, if I didn't have that timing and that speed, there's no way to do it. You have to have the body control and the speed to move out just at the right time to make him believe that something is there and he could hit it. I made sure everybody believed they could hit. And, and that's hard of the, you know, it's the heart of the trick is to make sure people believe that they could hit you. If they can't, they're not going to try. As a little kid, it was my favorite game. It's like tag. Here, you're it. Come get me. I can't, you can't get me. Yeah, my point. <laughs> I mean, look at uh, offenses today like uh, Jared Meinhardt and uh, uh, Alexander Marcialis. They started really young. And they knew the idea was not to get hit, primary. And then hitting while you're doing that became second nature. You could see especially in, in Alexander that he really is very good at about avoiding to get hit while hitting at the same time. So the reason I stopped fencing was because I wasn't making any money at it. Um, I, I was working a lot of part-time jobs so that I could continue competing. But at some point, I had to look at things and say, well, I need to start a career pretty soon. If I don't, what's my future going to be like? And so I put a time limit on it. It was, uh, if I didn't make the Olympic team by the time I was 30, I was done. And I was pretty happy with a lot of the achievements I had done by that point. You know, I had made several world championship teams. I made World, world University Games. Uh, I went to a lot of Olympic sports festivals. Um, I challenged a lot of fencers, very good high-level fencers. So I had a lot there. If I didn't make the team at 30, though, I really had to get on with my life. You know? Today, people might not look at it that way, but um, I wasn't exactly rich. I didn't come from a wealthy family. I really had to get on with stuff in life. Fencing taught me a great amount of um, perseverance more than anything else. Taught me to be patient and to succeed, it takes persistence. Because as I said, I was very good at fencing. I was talented, but I could only go so far with that. And I could train as hard as I want but it didn't guarantee any kind of success. It might get me further past a lot of people that weren't so good or uh, maybe not be able to handle that much power and strength. But at the higher levels, it didn't guarantee anything. By really persevering, by, by being persistent, by being determined, uh, it gives you a greater, greater amount of chance of success. And I've seen many talented people come and go from the sport. I thought, wow, that guy's really good. Next year, that guy's gone. Maybe for the same reasons I retired. Maybe he had to get on with his life, who knows? But for whatever reason, I'd see talent come and go out of the sport all the time. The people that make it and always have made it were those who persisted. Now, if you were talented and physically equipped and persistent, you'd have a long string of success. 
And you can look at the people who did work that hard and you can see what they've done. Like I know Peter Lewison worked really hard, not just defense, but he worked out in the workout room. He did his running, all everything else. Um, I know Greg Masialis was a fantastic competitive swimmer before he became a fencer. Uh, and Michael Marks, he always worked out. That's all he did. Fenced a lot, ran a lot. That's what he liked to do. So you look at that, and you, you know, uh, that's what I'm competing against. How do I succeed past them? How do I get past them? Uh, well, I work harder than they do. I work at it and just have to be persistent. 